chapter 49, we stopped on agents used to treat iron deficiency anemia. Page 866. Remember, guys, iron is very important for um, the production and the maintenance of RBCs, which carry hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen, right? So it's very important for perfusion. So let's talk about it. Although most people get all the iron they need through diet, in some situations, diet alone may not be adequate. The iron preparations that are available include, and they give you the different types of iron to make sure you guys are familiar with them. Let's talk about the therapeutic actions and indications of iron. Let me move back a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you guys are looking at these different types of iron, for testing purposes, the only time I've ever seen them present to you the iron is they always give you the um, ferrous sulfate. So out of all the irons, if you know you have a memory like me where I have limited capacity and you have to remember just one, make sure you remember the ferrous sulfate. Okay. You're welcome. All right, therapeutic actions and indications. Iron preparations elevate the serum iron concentration. They are then either converted to hemoglobin or trapped in the, I'm trying to pronounce this guys, reticulo endothelial cells for storage and eventual release and conversion into a usable form of iron for RBC production. So either way guys, iron is important for RBC production, which will in turn help with the hemoglobin one way or the other. They're indicated for the treatment of iron deficiency anemias and may also be used as adjunctive therapy in patients receiving erythropoiesis stimulating drug. Remember guys, adjunct therapy, that's always the therapy that you're giving that medication with something else. Now look at this, erythropoiesis stimulating drug. What type of patient would we give that medication to? Like what, what comes to your head? I see where you're going with kidney, but I, religion wise, we kind of oh. talk about this in ethics. Oh. Oh. Jehovah's Witness. Yes. Wow. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? Because the Jehovah's Witness, um, the, in a traditional sense, if they're not going to accept blood from someone else, we may give them something to stimulate that um, RBC production in their own body. Okay. Pharmacokinetics of iron. Iron dextran is a parental form of iron. You guys have to know this. And it's given by what method? <laughs> Z-track. It's given by Z-track method, which may be used if an oral form cannot be given or cannot be tolerated. So uh, ferrous sulfate, which we can give PO, right? That's the oral form. Some, and I'll talk to you guys about that in a little bit, but let's say the patient can't tolerate that oral form and we give them iron uh, dextran. It's very important that you guys understand this. Number one, it's given IM. It's got to go into the muscle, but it is very, very irritating and it's staining. So that's why we give it z track method. So you're going to clean off the skin, right? Move it to the side give them the injection, and then the let's, let the skin go. And what you when you do that, you're sealing in that iron. So number one, it's less irritating trying to come out of the muscle tissue. And two, remember, it's staining. So you're sealing it in, and that's why it's given the C-track method. Very important, and Clex expects you to know that. All right? Patients should be switched to the oral form, if at all possible, <coughs> excuse me, because of the pain that's associated with um, I, am I am administration of iron. Again, that's the second time they let us know that it's given how? I am. If you're giving that iron parentally, you're putting it in the muscle. Next page. Take a look at box 49.5. Again, the z track method is used when injecting iron to reduce the risk of sub-Q staining and irritation. The author's not repeating this information just for their health. This is important. You're going to see it on the test somewhere. That's why you're seeing it over and over again. Now look right below figure 49.4. 49 they're showing you that Z-track method. Let's go to this column. 
All right, iron, it can take two to three weeks to see improvement and up to six weeks to 10 months for a return to a stable iron level once deficiency exists. So if a patient is iron, has iron deficiency anemia and they're placed on iron, the doctor's not gonna recheck those lab levels until at least six weeks later because it really takes a while to see the serum levels increase. It's not something that happens overnight, okay? Iron is used during pregnancy and lactation to help the mother meet the increased demand for iron that occur at those times. Contraindications and cautions. Obviously, if the patient's allergic to iron. Hemochromatosis, that's excessive iron. Why would you give iron to somebody who already has a high level of iron in the system, right? Hemolytic anemias, which can increase the serum iron levels and cause the patient to have toxicity. Normal iron balance. If the patient has a normal level of iron, why would we give them more iron, right? We can cause them to have a toxic level of iron. Peptic ulcer, colitis, regional enteritis, because the drug can be directly irritating to these tissues and can cause exacerbation of those disease. Iron is very, very irritating. Adverse effects. The most common adverse effects associated with oral iron are related to the direct GI irritation. And that's why we wouldn't give the iron to patients who have something like peptic ulcers or colitis. Aren't those already GI issues that we wouldn't want to make worse? So adverse effects of iron, GI upset, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dark, stool, dark stools, ding, 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 test question, dark stools, constipation, ding, 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 test question. And Clex expects you to know that. So any patient that's on iron, you are expected to teach them to drink plenty of fluids. And when I say fluids, I mean water, not juice, right? Because the sugar and the juice can be constipating. So plenty of um, fluids as in water to eat foods high in fiber because it's constipating. With increasing serum levels, iron can be directly toxic to the CNS. That's why we don't want them to have too much, causing coma and even death. Parental iron. I'm sorry. No, I said interesting. Oh, okay. Parental iron is associated with severe anaphylactic reactions. Did it say allergic reactions? No. It said anaphylactic. And anaphylactic by itself is huge, right? Yeah. And then they put the word severe in front of it. So as a student, I would, bells would be going off in my head when I see this. Severe anaphylactic reactions, local irritation, staining of the tissues. That's why we do that D track method and phlebitis. Drug drug interactions. And on the side, I wrote, know this. Iron absorption decreases if iron preparations are taken with, and you guys have to know the list. Usually when NCLEX asks you about this, it is a select all that applies. So look at this list. Iron absorption is decreased when it's taken with antacids, tetracyclines, or cimetidine. If these drugs must be used, they should be spaced at least two hours apart. And on the side, I wrote why. I thought the book should have told you, but they didn't. So here's why. They fight for receptor sites. And guess what? Iron almost always loses. So when these drugs are taken together, they're both fighting for receptor sites in the gut, and usually iron loses out. And so the patient really does absorb the iron that they're, the way that they're supposed to. And that's why you want to space them out two hours apart. Something else. I'm sure we're going to see this, but you need to know this. Iron, when it's given orally, is always on an empty stomach. Okay? The only thing that you're going to teach that patient to take that iron with is going to be ascorbic acid, vitamin C. And the reason for that is that um, that ascorbic acid helps you absorb the iron. But you don't take it with food. You don't take it with anything else. You take it on an empty stomach with um, ascorbic acid. All right, anti-infective response to ciprofloxacin or offloxacin can decrease if the drugs are taken with iron. Again, two hours apart. Rule of thumb, empty stomach, unless you're taking it with vitamin C. Page 869. 
The effects of levodopa can decrease if it's taken with iron preparations. We haven't talked about, uh, oh no, we're gonna talk about that later. So, you know, patient with something with like Parkinson's disease that would be taking levodopa, um, if they take that with iron, that levodopa is not gonna be absorbed. Patients receiving both of the drugs, again, two hours apart, rule of thumb. Drugs, two hours apart. You never take anything with iron. Food drug interactions. Iron is not absorbed if taken with antacids, eggs, milk, coffee, or tea. Acidic liquids may enhance the absorption of iron and should not and should not be given concurrently. Aside from what? Vitamin C. Vitamin C. Very good. Um, Make sure you guys take a look at box 49.6. Take a look at that on your own. Let's jump to page 871, nursing considerations for patients receiving iron preparations. Look what I wrote on the side. Lots of select all that applies on iron. They love giving select all that applies when it comes to iron. I don't know why. They just do. What's that? Mm-hmm. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen, you know anything NCLEX does, I'm going to do to you. That's why I warn you, right? To prepare you. So, yeah, I'm going to kill you to select all the supplies when it comes to iron. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome. So, um, nursing considerations, you're going to assess them for any allergies, you're going to do a physical assessment on patient, inspect the color integrity of the skin mucous membranes, assess the patient's neurological status. You want to monitor their pulse, blood pressure, respiration, vital signs, inspect the abdomen for distension and auscultate bowel sounds, inspect the skin for integrity, monitor lab values. Page 872, look at implementation rationale. Ensure that iron deficiency anemia is confirmed before administering drugs. What if that patient had another type of anemia, such as thalassemia or sickle cell or something else, and here we go loading them up with iron, causing them to have iron toxicity, right? So you better confirm that um, it's iron deficiency anemia and not any other type of anemia before you start administering that iron. You're going to administer the oral form with meals that do not include eggs, milk, coffee, tea. I know that's what the book says, but guys, promise me I've been doing it. Promise me. Trust me, I've been doing this for a long time. For testing purposes, you, t- you tell them to take iron on what? Empty stomach. Empty stomach. Have the patient drink oral solutions through the straw. That's on NCLEX. Very important. Why? Iron is very staining and it will stain the patient's teeth. So you're going to teach them the liquid to drink through a straw. Caution the patient that the stools may be dark or green. It's going to turn their stools a dark, co- or a dark color. Remember, it's staining. Take measures to alleviate constipation. Teach them to eat lots of foods high in fiber, fruits, vegetables. Drink lots of water. That's on NCLEX. Administer IM only by what method? Z track method. That's on NCLEX. Very important to know. You're going to arrange for the H and H measurements before administration. And periodically during, why? You need a baseline and then you're gonna periodically check to make sure that this medication is being been effective. Provide comfort measures, support and encouragement. Again, if you're giving this medication parentally, we're going to give it IM z track method. Make sure you guys go back. I showed you, but make sure you guys go back and take a look at figure 49.4 on the z track method. Again, if it's liquid, they need to drink through the straw, drink through a straw, foods and fluids to avoid, to in- teach them the foods and fluids to avoid and to include to ensure proper absor- absorption, prevent constipation, remind them about the change in the stool color consistency, and potential for pain at site of injection. Key points. Iron products common, commonly cause constipation, nausea, green stools, and GI upset. Iron toxicity can cause severe CNS toxicity, coma, and even death in high iron levels. And that's why it's so important to make sure that if the patient's um, iron level is normal, we don't give them iron. 
If the patient already has too much iron in the system, we don't give them iron. All right, megaloblastic anemia. Agents for megaloblastic anemia. What did I write? Oh, here's what I wrote. I wrote think folate. So folate, just write this down and it'll make sense to you later. Folate equals alcoholism. B12 equals intrinsic factor. It'll make sense as we go. All right, agents for megaloblastic anemias. Megaloblastic anemia is treated with folic acid and vitamin B12. Again, those patients who tend uh, to be low in folate, those are the alcoholics. And we tend we give B12 to the patients who are missing intrinsic factor in the stomach. So for example, like a patient who's had a gastric bypass, part of their stomach's been removed and they're missing that intrinsic factor where they can no longer absorb the vitamin B12, okay? Vitamin B12 deficiency can result from poor diet or increased demand, but can also be due to lack of intrinsic factor in the stomach, which is necessary for absorption. So any condition, guys, that affects the stomach, because that's where um, the intrinsic factor is, right? If the patient doesn't have the intrinsic factor, they're not going to be able to absorb vitamin B12. And guess what? You need vitamin B12 to live. You will not live long without vitamin B12. Folic acid derivatives include folic acid, and they give you the list. Make sure you guys take a look at that. Vitamin B12 includes, and they give you that list. Make sure you know that. For the vitamin B12, when you see it ending in cobalamin, you know they're talking about your vitamin B12, okay? Therapeutic actions and indications. Folic acid and vitamin B12 are essential, absolutely necessary for cell growth and division and for the production of, of a strong stroma of red blood cells. Vitamin B12 is also necessary for maintenance of the myelin sheath in the nerve tissue. Folic acid is used as a rescue drug for cells exposed to some toxic chemotherapeutic agents. Pharmacokinetics, I don't touch on that often, but when I do, you know it's important for you to know. Parental drugs are preferred for patients with potential absorption problems. So remember guys, let's say that patient had a gastric bypass, their stomach's been removed or most of the stomach's been removed, removed and they don't have that intrinsic factor. What's the point of giving it to them orally? Are they going to be able to absorb it? No. So they're going to have to get it parentally. I am, by the way. All other patients should be given the oral form if at all possible. But this is very important for you to know. If the patient's unable to absorb that B12 through the gut, you have to give it parentally. And the famous scenario that they do give you on egg flights is that patient that's had the gastric bypass. And now um, they need this. How are you going to administer? What's your nursing intervention going to be? All right. Hydroxocobalamin. When you see it ending in cobalamin, they're talking about what? B12. B12. Very good. Hydroxocobalamin must be given how? I am. Not sub Q. Not intradermally. I am every day for five to 10 days to build up the levels. And then. Once a month for what? Life. Life. They will not live long without it. It cannot be taken orally because the problem with pernicious anemia is the inability to absorb vitamin B12 secondary to low levels of intrinsic factor. So there's no point of trying to give it orally. It has to be given IM every month until they die. These vitamins are considered essential during pregnancy and lactation because of the increased demand of the mother's metabolism. What I write here, prevents CNS problems and neural tube defects. This, guys, is, I promise you, it's going to be a test question when you guys get to uh, OB and P's. Okay? It prevents CNS problems and neural tube defects in the fetus. Contraindications and cautions. Known allergies, 
They should be used cautiously in patients who are pregnant. That's the thing you taught me then. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, that was close. All right, contraindications and cautions, known allergies. They should be used cautiously in patients who are pregnant or lactating or have other anemias. Nasal cyanocobalamin should be used with caution in the presence of nasal erosion or ulcers. And that makes sense, guys. If a person's got a cut in their nose and they're taking this um, nasally, it's going to in rapidly increase the rate of absorption, okay? Adverse effects, hydroxocobalamin has been associated with itching, rash, and signs of excessive vitamin B levels, which can also include peripheral edema and heart failure. Mild diarrhea, pain and discomfort. All right, let's talk about nursing considerations for patients receiving folic acid derivatives or vitamin B12. You're gonna assess them for any allergies, pregnancy, lactation, nasal erosion, especially if they take nasal form. You're gonna assess their baseline before giving the medication. Implementation rationale. Confirm the nature of the megaloblastic anemia to ensure proper drug regimen is being used. What's the purpose of giving the patient folate, B12, or both, and they really have iron deficiency anemia, right? Give both types of drugs in cases of pernicious anemia to ensure therapeutic effectiveness. This is our NCLEX. You need to know this. Parental vitamin B12. How many times have we seen this? Must be given how? I am every day for five to 10 days, right? Because we're trying to build it up. Then once a month for what? Life. Arrange for nutritional counsel. By the way, when... Um, and clerks, God bless you, likes to ask when, about a delegation. You, the RN, you're the one who has to call the physician and ask for the consult. Whenever you need a consult, let's say you need a registered dietitian, you need a, a, a speech therapy evaluation, physical therapy, whatever that evaluation is, you cannot delegate that to the LPN. You, the RN, you have to pick up the phone and speak to the physician and ask for those consults, okay? You can't order the consult, but you have to be the one to ask the doctor for it. Um, you're going to monitor for the possibility of hypersensitivity reactions. Arrange for the hematocrit readings before and periodically during therapy. Provide comfort measures, small frequent meals, um, analgesia, especially if they're getting it IM because it's going to be painful. Offer support and encouragement. All right, we're moving on to agents for sickle cell anemia. Hydroxyurea is a cytotoxic antineoplastic drug, so this is cancer drug, right? That's also used to treat leukemia, ovarian cancer, and melanoma. It also treats sickle cell. Therapeutic actions and indications. Hydroxyurea increases the amount of fetal hemoglobin produced in the bone marrow, dilutes the formation of the abnormal hemoglobin S in adults who have sickle cell anemia. So that's how it works. Contraindications and cautions. Patient has any allergies, if they have severe anemia or leukopenia, because that could make the a bone marrow uh, suppression even worse. If they have impaired liver or renal function. 
Hydroxyurea should only be used in pregnancy and lactation if the benefit to the mother clearly outweighs the potential risk to the fetus or baby. Adverse effects? Remember guys, this drug is cytotoxic. That's why it's used in cancer patients. Cyto cells, toxic killer of, it kills cells. So um, in the cancer patients, we want them to kill the bad cells, but these drugs, they don't differentiate, they just kill cells, right? So we have to be very careful. GI effects include anorexia, nausea, vomiting, stomach titus. Does stomach titus have anything to do with your stomach? No. no. Mouth. Your mouth, very good. The inflammation of the muco mucous membranes of the mouth. I have so many students who will think stomach. Don't fall for it, no. Diarrhea, constipation, dermatological effects include rash, erythema, and bone marrow suppression usually occurs. And that's why we won't give this to a patient who has something like leukemia, where they're already dealing with severe bone marrow suppression. Does that make sense? All right. Headache, dizziness, disorientation, fever, chills, malaise have been reported. As with other cytotoxic drugs, there's an increased risk of cancer development. And you guys learned about that when we covered the, the cancer drug. So the same drug that we're trying to kill the cancer with can cause that patient to develop other types of cancers or even tumors. Nursing considerations for the patient taking hydroxyurea. Oh, sorry. <laughs> It says, um, go to chapter 14. We covered all of that already. So you guys can, we did, didn't we? Okay, yeah. did. Yes, we did. I know we did. Because yeah, I went we over did. the cancer drugs with you. We did. Okay. So go over that. All of those nursing implementations that we covered with those cytotoxic meds, same thing. Of course I would care to test you on it. Nice try, though. <laughs> She has to try. She has to try. Aplastic anemia. Box 49.7. Aplastic anemia is a disease caused by damage to the bone marrow and the bone marrow stem cells. Remember, guys, the bone marrow, that's what's responsible for making your blood cells, your RBCs, your platelets, your WBCs. The damage can be caused by drugs, radiation exposure, infections, immune pancytopenia disorders, and sometimes genetics. There are deficiencies in all of the blood components formed in the bone marrow, and that's called pancytopenia. Pan, everything. Cyto, blood cells. Penia, a little bit of. So a little bit of your WBCs, a little bit, which will put you at risk for infection, a little bit of your platelets, which will put you at risk for bleeding, and a little bit of your RBCs, which will put you at risk for anemia. Oh, that's what I just explained to you here. So low RBC, that causes your anemia, low WBC, leukopenia, low platelet count, rhombocytopenia. Patient will be at high risk for bleeding because of the loss of platelets, high risk for infection because of the loss of WBCs, and they'll often be tired and pale because of the loss of RBCs. Remember, RBCs carry hemoglobin, which carry oxygen. Oxygen is what gives you energy to do stuff. That's why patients who are anemic are always so tired and fatigued because their tissues are not being perfused with oxygen, okay? Key points. Don't forget, megaloblastic anemia is treated with folic acid and vitamin B12. Patients receiving these drugs require periodic blood tests. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder. That's very important for you guys to know. I think that's the first time we've seen it, but they should have mentioned it a couple more times in the book because you're definitely tested on it on, not definitely tested, but it's been seen on NCLEX quite a few times. Okay, it's a genetic disorder, hemoglobin formation that can lead to clogging of the blood vessels with resulting anoxia and severe pain. It didn't just say pain, it said what? Severe. severe pain. I teach on my videos, there are three situations where, because pain's never a priority, right? But there's three situations, pain is a priority. You treat pain as you would treat anything that falls under physiological integrity. That's burns, 
myocardial infarction. Actually, there's four things. Stones and sickle cell. We just went over Pain it. is a, you just, it's a it's yeah. part. Yeah. No, you mean uh, for no. med surge. Med surge. Yeah. Yeah. Pain is a priority in those four situations. Hydroxyurea and oh wait, let me back up because you guys get a test question. You're not gonna get it from me because I'm not a med surgeon, but I'm just saying. You guys get a test question that about a patient. You give the pain medicine answers. You what? You give the pain medicine anyways. <laughs> Can I finish the question? So patients in sickle cell crisis, occlusive crisis. What do you do first? Do you give them oxygen first? Do you give them fluids first? Do you give them pain medication first? Or do you, whatever some, the fourth random choices? What's the answer? Pain meds, what would you, anyone else? It depends on how they're oxygen. Anyone else? No, it's not select all of them. The first thing you're going to do is fluids. Fluids? I'm going to explain to you why. And let me tell you, this has popped up on end questions so many times that this question is going to get it wrong. Because you guys have been drilled in your head oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. But I said occlusive, right? So what's happening in sickle cell, they're not getting um, lots of things can cause the sick one. But um, the most common thing that causes sickling when it comes to sickle cell is dehydration. That's why you're teaching the patient to always walk around with a water bottle because those cells that used to be like this and we want them nice and round because that's how they float in the blood vessel, right? Dehydration causes them to go like this and they start to clump together. Like I said, it's not only dehydration, it could be lots of other things. But I told you when I was sitting there, what kind of crisis did I say it was? Occlusive. So they're all clumping together, right? So when a patient is in sickle cell crisis and it's occlusive, their problem really is a lack of oxygen because the oxygen is in these RBCs. The problem is the RBCs are getting to the tissues because they're all clumped together. But the minute you give that patient fluid, they go from this back to this. And then they flow to the tissues like they need to. So in occlusive crisis, the problem is not oxygen. The oxygen's there. It's right there in the, in the cells. The problem is that the cells are um, sickle and clumped up together and they can't go to the tissues. But the minute you give them fluids, they go back to the shape and they go back to the cells, uh, the tissues that they need to go to. So do not fall for that. Don't say I didn't warn you. All right. Summary. No. Hydroxyurea. It's an anti-neoplastic drug. It's useful in reduction, in reducing the painful crises and need for blood transfusions in adults with sickle cell anemia. Summary, RBCs are produced in the bone marrow in a process called erythropoiesis. RBCs do not have a nucleus. Their lifespan is what? 120 days, you guys have to know that. The bone marrow uses iron, amino acids, carbohydrates, folic acids, and vitamin D to produce healthy, efficient RBCs. An insufficient number of, excuse me, an insufficient number or immaturity of RBCs results in low oxygen levels in the tissues with tiredness, fatigue, and loss of reserve. Because remember, the oxygen is what gives you the energy. So if those RBCs are not mature, or you don't have enough RBCs, that means you don't have enough hemoglobin carrying capacity. If you don't have enough hemoglobin carrying capacity, you definitely don't have enough oxygen. And it's the oxygen that gives you the energy. It's a domino effect. Iron is needed to produce hemoglobin, which carries oxygen. How many times have we seen this? Iron deficiency anemia is treated with iron replacement. Iron is a toxic mineral at high levels. Remember, it can cause patients to go into coma. It can kill a patient. The body controls the absorption of iron and carefully regulates its storage and movement in the body. 
Folic acid and vitamin B12 are needed to produce a strong supporting structure in the RBC so that it can survive how many days? 120 days. That's the lifespan of the RBC. A dietary lack of or inability to absorb folic acid, vitamin B12, or both will produce megaplastic anemia in which the RBCs are large, but they're immature and they have a short lifespan. Pernicious anemia, that's the lack of vitamin B12. If vitamin B12 is lacking, these neurons will degenerate and cause many of the CNS effects. Pernicious anemia is caused by deficient production of intrinsic factor by the gastric cells. So if something's going on with your stomach, they don't have that intrinsic factor, they, they have to get in parentally. Intrinsic factors needed to allow the body to absorb B12. If intrinsic factor is lacking, B12 must be given parentally or intranasally for how long? For life. Or they will die and they will die soon. Sickle cell anemia is what type of disorder? Genetic. Genetic. Matter of fact, it's autosomal recessive. You guys need to know that. Not for me, but if that's, if you guys taking um, at ATI and you guys have anemia, I would know that if I were you. I promise you it's in your textbook. You need to know that. Anyway, it's a genetic disorder characterized by production of hemoglobin S, which is the abnormal hemoglobin. Sickle cell anemia is treated with antibiotics, pain relieving measures, and the cytotoxic drug hydroxyurea, which causes increased fetal hemoglobin production in the bone marrow and dilution of hemoglobin S with a resultant reduction in RBC stacking and clogging of the blood vessels.